Hello, everyone. I'm Michele Zorzi from the University of Padova, and I'm introducing the talk on uh, non terrestrial networks for 6G scenarios. Now, we have three experts today. So, Dr. David Lopez Perez will start from Huawei Labs with uh, some perspective on Jung's cases. Then, Professor Mohamed Slim Alouini from uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology will uh, uh, give us perspective on uh, uh, technical challenges, and I will conclude with some enabling technologies. David? Hi everyone, this is David Lopez from Huawei Technologies, speaking from Paris, France. As Michele was mentioning, we are going to talk about non-terrestrial networks, and you may be wondering why are we doing this, why non-terrestrial networks are important. They are important because of the use cases that they enable. According to uh, my perspective, that is in line to that of the 5G, uh, 3GPP, Three are the main families of use cases that non-terrestrial networks can make a reality. These families are service ubiquity, service continuity, and service scalability. Let me introduce you each one of them one by one in the following. Service ubiquity. Service ubiquity attempts to provide access where terrestrial networks may not be able due to economic reasons or due to disasters. Here you can think of satellites being used to provide fixed access or butthole to cell towers located in remote areas or disaster ones. Service continuity. Service continuity attempts to enable a continuous access to 5G services while the end user device moves around in connected mode through very different areas. In this case, you can think of, of a ship roaming between terrestrial and satellite networks. The ship leaves the harbor and then it moves out of the coverage area of the terrestrial network. Then it selects the satellite connectivity for tracking and communication purposes. And after some time upon arrival, it switches back to the terrestrial network when it arrives to a new harbor. Service scalability. Service scalability attempts to offload traffic from terrestrial networks at peak hours when the tsunami of data happens and terrestrial networks cannot may not cope. Here you can think of satellites multicasting for popular content delivery or sending al alerts warnings. You can also think about uh, satellites offloading the traffic from non-delay sensitive applications or from outdoor users in line of sight or high mobility ones to relieve the pain in the terrestrial network. Now, uh, what are we doing in the industry to make all these use cases possible? So the 3GPP, which is the, the body standardized in cellular technology, has been working since release 15 in specifying non-terrestrial features for its latest technology, new radio. In release 15, the study item on non-terrestrial networks selected deployment scenarios, key parameters, and channel models that allowed us to study non-terrestrial networks. Later on, in release 16, the study item further studied potential architectures and high-layer protocols and physical layer aspects to continue evolving our knowledge of non-terrestrial networks. In release 17, the work item started, and there, the specification work was done around timing relationships, uplink synchronization, and enhan enhancements on HRQ processes. Now, you may be wonder what is currently being, doing, being done in the standardization forum. So currently, within release 17, work is being done on satellite access for handheld devices operating in sub-7 gigahertz uh, frequencies. Particular, particular attention is being put into narrowband IoT and enhanced machine type of communications for Internet of Things services. Release 18, which is about to start, is expected to look into high frequencies, those above 10 gigahertz, and the focus here is providing satellite access to fixed and moving platforms like uh, aircraft, vessels, and UAVs, and also to 
entities, uh, receivers mounted in buildings with high their activity. An important item of work that is expected to be done is that on optimized coverage and enhanced mobility. Uh, satellites move quite fast and that generates some issues with the mobile users. Last but not least, before concluding my part, I want to mention that this new paradigm of networking poses some fundamental questions to operators themselves. Most of operators, they own a terrestrial network, all of them own a terrestrial network. And now questions arrive like, are these non-terrestrial networks a competitors, are they coming to complement my network? And if so, how should I do it? Which is the optimum way to do it? And here all sort of questions arise from user association, assignment of frequencies, dimension you know, of the system, et cetera, et cetera. So with this uh, talk today, my colleagues and you, we want to motivate some of the research topic where you may come and help us to make these uh, non-terrestrial networks a reality. With that, I would like to hand over to the next speaker. It's my pleasure to follow up on uh, what David started with and focus on um, uh, UAV as communication, in particular, to talk about the challenges that this kind of network face. So, uh, as you know, uh, UAV as communication are becoming popular for a variety of applications displayed in the view graph in front of you emergency communication, offloading in massive events. Of course, they have been already uh, used in military context and they can be used also to connect the and connect it when they are used in the form of uh, HAPS or high altitude platforms. Now, why do you like uh, UAV communication? We like them because they offer uh, a better probability of line of sight, given that they are flying at a relatively high altitude compared to ground base station. And then uh, the other extra advantage that UAV present is that they can track the time varying traffic demand spatial distribution. So this extra mobility and relocation flexibility give them this great advantage in comparison to static base station. However, we do have some challenges. One of the main challenges is that we have a limited battery capacity that make the flight time of this UAV uh, essentially uh, some, somehow uh, be around one hour to 90 minutes. And again, because of this limited battery capacity, we have restriction on the payload, which means that typically we cannot uh, uh, basically fly uh, uh, on board uh, like uh, any kind of base station with sophisticated MIMO and signal processing. So that's uh, limitation of challenge number one. Challenge number two, we have to remember that the relay is acting at the end of the day, uh, sorry, the UAV is acting at the end of the day as relay, which means that it needs to be backhauled through a feeder link to a gateway on the ground. This has to be done wirelessly, so you need to allocate wireless or spectrum resource for this backhaul. This uh, uh, backhaul can be unreliable, uh, can be uh, uh, eavesdropped, can be jammed. Uh, in other words, the UAV can be hijacked, and you may be dealing at some point with the drone flyaway risk and problem and all the safety issues that come with that. Now, how can we address this issue, at least on the short term? Uh, we are advocating for the usage of tethered UAV. So a tethered UAV is like an untethered UAV with the difference that it is connected to a ground station uh, via a tether, a cable. This cable will provide power and that with that you have like long hours of flying. So you kind of bypass the kind of uh, flight time restriction that untethered UAV suffer from. And also you can insert within this uh, tether or cable, a fiber optic, and with that, you backhaul your uh, UAV. So uh, you are basically solving all the challenges that we are, uh, uh, or we mentioned earlier. So uh, in a nutshell, if you look at this web diagram, uh, 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 as a short-term solution, this tethered UAV can match the rest of the station from a backhaul capacity, and of course, outperform and tethered UAV. They can match the endurance of a terrestrial base station from a payload, obviously you cannot carry as much as a terrestrial base station. So it's like a bridge, a trade-off between kind of an untethered UAV and a terrestrial base station. Of course, uh, you'll be losing anything related to mobility and relocation in comparison to an untethered UAV, but still you will do much better than a terrestrial base station. So this tethered UAV solution is kind of an in-between solution between 
current terrestrial base station and the envisioned anterior UAV that we'll see as part of beyond 5G or evolution of 5G. Now, if you want to scale this up and get a larger coverage area, you can go and start implementing these uh, tethered balloons or airship or aerostat that fly at an even higher altitude. When we talk about tether UAV, we are talking at an altitude of 150, 200 meter maximum. But then uh, if you go for these kind of balloons, we can go for altitude anywhere between 500 meters to one kilometer with a coverage area that can be of the order of a radius of 50 to 60 kilometer. And that can be quite interesting in the context of rural communication. But uh, at the end of the day, and that will be my last slide, uh, uh, our objective as wireless telecom engineers is to always move wireless, right? So we don't like tethers, we don't like cables. So the point or the question we ask ourselves, how can we implement this tether UAV type of paradigm without a tether? And the way to go, or what we're proposing, is to implement a virtual tether. This virtual tether can be implemented in the form of a laser beam, and the laser beam can have enough power to basically uh, uh, transfer power to the UAV, which through energy harvesting, the UAV can basically keep flying, uh, so we don't need to, the, to basically go back and recharge. And again, through the so-called slipped concept, simultaneous light and formation and power transfer, uh, we can uh, use the same laser beam uh, to basically communicate through free space optics. So that's in a nutshell what I want to talk uh, today about, and I would like to give the floor to uh, the next speaker, Professor Micheli Zorzi. Thank you, Slim. I'm Michele Zorzi from the University of Padova. And uh, after hearing use cases and uh, uh, challenges, uh, let me say some words about enabling technologies. As communications engineers, we'd like to make sure that wireless communication for these systems is enabled through uh, the proper technologies. Now, the technologies I'd like to talk about uh, are listed here. Uh, the first is, of course, antenna technology. Uh, this is a different field. So there are antenna experts out there who are doing good work to make sure that we can enable highly directional communications uh, so that the high antenna gains enable high data rates, even over large distances, uh, for example, uh, as found in satellite systems. Now, more related to wireless communications uh, is uh, uh, the use of new spectrum and uh, architectural concepts at the network level. Now, millimeter waves have become popular in the context of 5G because uh, they allow the use of uh, wide bands, which translate into high data rates available. And so they are very attractive, uh, but because of the frequencies being used, uh, they have more severe attenuation than in traditional systems. And so this poses a problem to close the link for these uh, communications. Uh, luckily, the small wavelength allows us to pack many antenna elements in a small form factor, thereby compensating with antenna gain what we're losing in terms of attenuation. But the basic question remains, like, will this be technologically feasible? So can we support high data rates over long distances as in satellite systems, given that we're using this technology. And so that's one question I will try to address. The second area is uh, architecture of network. So we have new components, uh, uh, so small satellites, uh, you know, large constellation of uh, small objects, uh, uh, trends in networking, softwareization, virtualization, and also, as was clear from the previous talks, uh, we don't have just satellites or drones. We have varied scenario where all of these components may be there, satellites, uh, high altitude platforms, drones. And so it becomes important to understand how we can orchestrate all of them together, trying to optimize the network in what becomes uh, a complex scenario. And so this also is a challenge. And the question here is, uh, what is the possible architecture that uh, is suitable for these kind of scenarios? And uh, uh, what is the achievable performance? Now, look at a millimeter wave, uh, the link budget in a satellite system is shown here. Uh, now, the first two terms are very traditional and are found in terrestrial systems as well. The basic path loss related to distance and penetration loss, so for example, going from in outside to inside a building going through a wall. In addition, for satellite systems, since the signals travel that portion of the atmosphere that is typically not traversed by terrestrial systems, they're 
we can find other phenomena which are usually ignored in cellular systems but become important in this kind of links uh, scintillation and absorption which provide additional attenuation and need to be accounted for in order to uh, properly design the system. So the 3GPP has provided a channel model for this kind of system, which takes this into account. They provide equations and parameters. And so we used those to make some calculation and make sure that given all these, the link budget is in fact appropriate. And so this picture, which was obtained by going through those calculations, shows uh, how as a function of frequency and as a function of the antenna gain, we can achieve a certain capacity, so data rate, for different systems of satellites. GEO is geostationary at 36,000 kilometers from the Earth. Uh, MEO is uh, medium Earth uh, orbit, so 10,000 kilometers, and LEO low Earth orbit, uh, 300 or a few hundred kilometers in general. And so you can see that you know, as, as you go up in frequency, the attenuation becomes higher, but also there is more bandwidth available, as you can see from the table up here. So these are the reference value we use. So at, at lower frequencies, you have channels with 20 megahertz, which provide limited capacity. As you go up to millimeter wave, you can have even gigahertz of bandwidth, and this translates into higher capacity. And so the trade-off between more bandwidth and more attenuation uh, is non-trivial and needs to be uh, studied. So in this case, you see that as we go up in frequency, we grow the capacity, but then at some point uh, we flatten the curve. And if you go even higher, then you'll go down because then attenuation wins over the additional bandwidth you have. What is important from this picture is that if you look at uh, uh, these frequencies and uh, as a function of the uh, antenna gains, then you can see that if we can provide antenna gains more than 50 dB, then we can access rates that are of the order of a few gigabits per second. And so the answer to the question is that, yes, if we can provide enough antenna gain, and this is not outrageously high, this is something that is actually achievable in practice, we can make the system work, which is, of course, uh, good news. Now, the second question about the architecture, uh, here are some reference scenarios we studied. So let's say we have a geostationary satellite here that communicates directly to the Earth. So that's a long link. That's, let's say this is the, our baseline. Then we can have relays in between. So a LEO here or a HAB here or maybe both. And we wonder, you know, what is the rate at which we can communicate through this line network. This is essentially a network because it starts a single link. It's multiple links, one after the other. And so now the need is to address the performance from an end-to-end -end basis, not a single link, which makes things a bit difficult, more difficult than usual. And so we want to compare these different solutions using this kind of uh, evaluation. As an example of uh, results we achieve, let's say here at low frequencies to the left, two gigahertz, then the uh, geo satellite, the baseline is the worst because it has a long link. If we break that link into two using a LEO, then you do a little better. If you break it using a HAP, you do even better. And this is because uh, uh, the way attenuation works through the atmosphere. So if you break the attenuation in between, then you can get some benefit instead of uh, going through the whole atmosphere in one shot. Okay. Now, if you go to millimeter wave, then things change. You can see here that the ranking of the curves is significantly different. In fact, the LEO solution is the worst. The GEO is uh, slightly better. And the HAP solution with the high altitude platforms is significantly better than all of the others. So this can be explained, actually. Uh, I don't have time to go through that. You can find the uh, description of these effects in the paper mentioned up there. But suffice it to say that uh, the trade-offs involved here are non-trivial and some things you know, emerge uh, that need to be explained and understood before we can design the system properly. So you know, what I want to show here by uh, what is little more than back of the envelope calculations is that uh, in this new scenario, uh, the mindset uh, needs to be changed and uh, some non-trivial trade-offs emerge that need to be understood for us to be able to design the system properly. And with that, we conclude this conversation. Thanks, everyone, for attending.
Thank <laughs> you.